So welcome everybody to Live Performance Australia's Greener Live Performances Through Energy Efficiency webinar. Thanks for everyone for attending. We're hoping to really drill down into what energy efficiency means for outdoor events using mobile power generators and specifically looking at siting and sizing and distribution of mobile power generators. Um, you may have seen uh, some resources that we've developed so far from the Life Performance Australia uh, program and they've been developed in coordination with a number of organisations, Green Shoot Pacific, uh, which is my organisation, uh, Dynamic Eco Solutions and also uh, EC3 Global. So you'll, you'll have a, a good look on the website if you'd like to at the wonderful diagnostic tools, fact sheets, checklists, operation guides, etc. that we've uh, produced and we'll be continuing to produce right through until 2015. So today what we want to have a look at is what energy efficiency really means for outdoor events using mobile power. In a general situation, the term energy efficiency for a building is very easy to understand, but with mobile power generators, things get a little bit tricky. So we're going to be drilling down into um, concepts such as optimising capacity, sizing and siting, and of course how we actually measure efficiency. I want to hear from everybody on the webinar today. I, this is really a role for me to be a facilitator and for you to share your challenges, your tricks of the trade and how you actually uh, achieve efficiency at your events and what efficiency means for you. As you can see on the screen, efficiency purely means in a definition sort of uh, case of using less energy to achieve the same effect. So that's what I want to have a look at today and see what that really means for our situation in outdoor events. So obviously we've got concepts such as reducing the total fuel used and there's many ways that we can uh, get to that point. We can reduce the number of the size of the generators. We could look at uh, more efficient loading of course and even running generators for shorter hours and powering them down completely. I think for me it means fewer, smaller and shorter running generators, but I really want to hear what it means for you. So the first thing obviously that we need to look at is to understand what our power demand is going to be, you know, knowing your power. And that's been the crux of most of the Live Performance Australia's uh, resources to date when we're looking at mobile power generators. As you'd know, I'm sure all of the site managers and event managers on the call today and all of the generator providers and suppliers and, and electricians know that estimating your power demand is absolutely the key to uh, to becoming efficient, to be uh, planning in your generator sizes and how many you need and where you're going to place them is the ultimate for efficiency to be achieved. And so knowing your power, I think, is the preeminent um, issue at hand today. So what I'd like to do is hear from as many uh, of you on the call today about how you've managed to actually achieve energy efficiency uh, or what you think energy efficiency actually is and what it means for you. I know that we've got uh, people on the call today from Falls Festival. Uh, we've got Sydney um, Festival, I hope, on the call. We've, I know that we've got um, Coates Hire on the call today as well as I can see somebody from Royal Botanic Gardens and I'm sure there's a couple of other people that I've missed out as well. So I'm wondering perhaps firstly we might go to Coates Hire and see what they have to say about you know what, what their main concerns are with being able to provide the right specifications in terms of the sizing and, and number of generators to, um, to event to event uh, clients, I think that's probably a really good place to start. So on the call today, we have um, Corey and also Sonia from from Coates Hire. So perhaps we can uh, hear from Corey as, to start with. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, actually, I'm going to pass this one to Steve Lincoln, our product uh, expert. Okay. Um, He's, um, he's, he's well positioned to answer this question. Steve, you're on the line, mate. 
Yeah, I hope Steve's on the line. Steve, um, Steve's coming up on our web viewer, but his audio doesn't seem to be working as yet. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's okay. So I know that we've got Chris from um, from Falls Festival, and I know that we've got Ali from, uh, sorry, Abby from Falls Festival, and I'm wondering maybe from a, while we wait for Steve to come on the line. Um, whether we can hear from an event manager's point of view, you know, what what are the challenges in being able to estimate power demand and how do you go through that process to actually end up working out the number and the size of generators? And do you find yourself in a situation where you either have over specced or under spec Does it completely rely on, um, you know, event knowledge and gut feel of what, you have done before and will do in the in the future or do you really rely on very specific you know science and getting quite a lot of detail from from potential power users so chris um i know that you're on the call would you be happy to talk to some of those points from a site manager's point of view yeah sure hi can you hear me yeah we can hear you fine well i think particularly um from a catering perspective we put a lot of work in pre to um, get each and every demand from the caterer to so then we can have a really good idea of, of the power demand that they would require. Um, obviously with us we have a number of caterers so we'll do a few different areas of generators so we can we can sort of have a really good idea of, of the power requirements by just simply getting all of their materials and what they plan to use during the show. Yeah, okay. And do you use any um, specific, you know, uh, worksheets or in, in when you're contracting people in or in various, you know, communications that you have with people, do you do, do you formalise it? Um, Abby could probably comment more on that um, from an operations point of view. I think Abby's on the line at the minute. Yeah, she is. Um, Abby, what, what have you got to share on yes. that? Yes. Um, hi guys, can you hear me as well? Yes, we can hear you fine. Great. Um, as far as the caterers go, part of their actual uh, official application form um, is them detailing exactly how many 10 amp plugs they require, how many 15 amp, whether they require three phase. So it really is quite specific and recorded during that application process. Um, then if between the application and the actual show there, requirements change then we're in constant communication with them and ask for any updates and then just before the show we give them a, um, a copy of all the information that they've given us and ask them to review that before the actual show day and then if they do want more power then we charge them accordingly when they get on site. So it's really specific for the caterers and the market stalls to be able to measure that but I think for the rest of the site it's kind of the site managers who estimate what we've had in the past, um, production obviously are able to give some pretty um, specific requirements of what they need, but we do work really hard across the rest of the site to group generators and areas like that. But um, it's definitely specific for the caterers, but the rest of the site is the site manager's brilliance and experience <clears throat> to figure out what we need. Yeah, okay. Have Have you got uh, either real information or a, a good gut feel, you know, knowing or knowing the numbers of generators that you've placed around a site and their sizes, what your proportion of generator, of power demand would be, say, from the catering sort of site facility side of things compared with stages, so AV? Yeah. Better, can you get, yeah. answer that one? Yeah, I'll just unmute uh, Chris. <coughs> Uh, hang on a moment. Sorry about that. There we go. You're unmuted. Yeah. Oh, I'm back on here. Sorry, can you repeat the question, Megan? So the question was, do you have a good feel? Hang on, I'm just going to mute Abby. I think we've got some um, background noise thing going on. Um, what the question was, was do you have a good feel on how much energy is demanded by your caterers compared to AV? You know, have you... Obviously, you can um, do it by counting out the number of generators, but if you had to sort of, you know, 60, 40, 20, 20 80, 70, 30 it, what would you say is the proportion of power demand from your um, caterers and site requirements compared to your stages, just to put it in sort of perspective? Uh, look, to, 
overall we had like at, at our event last year we had 34 generators so yeah um from a you know our stages are, are limited we have two major stages so so really it's a small percentage of our total generators mm. overall um the lawn festival that i work on has been going for 21 years now so we have a really good idea of um the power requirements and we've we've basically set up our site to be semi-permanent. A few years we implemented a, um, um, we went underground around the entire site so we can minimise our, our use of, of generators. So basically it's been a, it's been, you know, 21 years in the making to get to where we are now. Yeah. Um, and so we're, I mean, ultimately what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of generators we use on site. Okay. Um, so it's working with our production team and our caterers and, and you know, and, and 21 years of of, um, of statistics, I guess, to know what is required. Mm. Yeah, that, no, that's really, really important. Unfortunately, many events don't have the pleasure of having that long, deep history to draw on. And I know that uh, you know you've got a lot of uh, continuity with your with your team as well. So that knowledge is absolutely incredibly valuable. Yeah, for sure. Um, when you're talking about reducing the number of generators, are you? Um, talking about reducing total KVA at the same time or are you talking about reducing your distribution so putting more onto larger generators? What's your, you know, what's the way that you're trying to go there? Yeah, well, a bit of both actually. But as a, as a I mean, what we're trying to do, what we've, what we've managed to do in the last few years is, is maintain the same amount of generators that we've had but our site is, is growing. So... Yeah, we've been able to loop different areas um, by just maybe in one area, say for instance, getting a larger generator and then linking that to more areas. For example, our backstage okay. area yeah. uh, has just grown and grown with our VIPs and, and backstage artist area, but we've been able to maintain the same sort of generator um, in that area, but also power different parts of the site on that same generator Okay, so just by going underground. Okay, that's really good. So that that is a definitely a, a good trick that a lot of uh, those with permanent sites are doing is putting that distribution in so that they can um, rationalise the number of generators. Obviously, there's impacts with regards to delivering them to remote sites, but yeah, getting more bang for your buck, I guess, in that case. Um, we will hear hopefully from some generator techs uh, coming up, uh, knowing uh, to talk about uh, the the effects on fuel consumption when you have a smaller number of larger generators that perhaps aren't being utilised all of all of the time because we see the reverse of that happening in some scenarios where the most efficient option is actually to have more uh, generators and more smaller generators so that it enables you to power them completely down when they're not needed. So I think uh, what we find is that both solutions are actually very um, relevant but it completely depends on your scenario which makes of course giving advice very tricky because every single event scenario needs you know personal attention obviously so thank you very much for sharing that I'm going to mute you now Chris so that you can cough or take phone calls in the background um, uh, now I know that we've got Stephen from Coates Hire on the line but Stephen, uh, when we're looking at you on the phone sort of dashboard, it has no phone next to your name. So I'm not sure how you're actually connected with us. Um, perhaps, Sonia, you can enlighten us. Uh, you have to press hash 8 hash to enable muting on your phone. Um, but maybe in the meantime, we can talk to Corey and he might be able to, you know, give us some feedback on a generator company's point of view while we try and work out how we can get Stephen on the line. No, it doesn't sound like we've got Corey there at all. Okay, so what I might do now, I know that we've got Mick Jessup from Sydney Festival on the line as well. And Mick, you're, you're calling in via the phone. You have to press hash 27 hash to enable your muting so that we can hear you. It did sound like we just had someone just come on the line now. Was that Stephen or was that Sonia? Or was that perhaps Corey? No, we didn't have anybody come on the line at all. Okay, so what I'd like to do, no, I can hear somebody. Who's that out there that I can hear? 
Corey, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear Corey. Okay. Oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah great. Yeah, okay, good. Thanks, yeah. Corey. <laughs> We want to hear. No from, we do want to hear from Stephen, but we're uh, we're not unable to get him on on the audio, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there. So, Corey, you may need to uh, opt in from Coates' point of view. Uh, looking, okay. what, we're, what we're discussing is how uh, the generator companies are receiving information from the event managers uh, in order to make really accurate and efficient. Uh, estimations on generator sizing. Yeah, I think I think our, our sort of best work is when we work close with the event organisers around where to position generators. Um, you know, we, we we offer a service where we can help you advise you on the lowest amount of cable to be used. So you 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 obviously where your biggest load is, you put your biggest generator um, and try and distribute from there, uh, limiting the cable run obviously so you don't have volt drop. Um, and peripheral generators um, for catering and those type of things, we can we can help size for those. Yeah. Um, I think the events that are like, uh, you know, like Chris and they were saying at 21 years old, there's not much value we can add because they probably have a very good handle on it. Yeah. It's a sort of younger, newer event that we um, that we really come into our own with uh, sizing the generator, making sure we have the right distribution equipment, you know, in terms of outlets on them, uh, uh, because they wouldn't have being that far down the road in terms of putting permanent distribution in it. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, um, yeah, and, and you know, I think I think our previous um, teleconference we spoke about using you know energy efficient equipment and advising that you know it's probably best to steer clear from Bay Marines because they draw a lot of power. You know that type of stuff. Yeah, well, I... the end, you know, you know, steer the end user towards a more energy efficient uh, setup. The caterers. Yeah, for sure. And I'd, I'd like to explore the concepts of energy efficient equipment on power yeah. generators. And when we're, yeah. when we're switching off equipment that the generator is still running or when we're putting more efficient equipment on a generator but not changing yeah. the generator size, I think that a lot of event organisers would like to know, you know, oh, you know, in a house obviously or a building, you turn the lights off, you, you're stopping power demand and you're reducing um, obviously your, your cost as well as your GH greenhouse gas emissions. But for a mobile yep. generator, it's very different. And so I'd like to try and explore um, and, and get the answer, I guess, really for gen for event organisers and for power users that if they, go, if they go with that sort of efficiency feeling of turning things off and being as frugal as possible, yep. putting energy mm -hmm. efficient equipment onto generators, what does that actually mean if the generator is turned on and chugging away? Is it going to react yeah. to that demand or is the fuel just still getting consumed? Have we got our foot on the accelerator but we're not going anywhere? You know, what, what's yeah. the real story here? I think I think it's, it's good to start off that a generator runs at 1,500 RPM. Okay. So you have a base fuel consumption just if it's chugging away without load. Um, so your biggest benefit is to size it accurately. They're running at 70 to 80 percent of its load. Um, there, you get the best, uh, you know, bang for your money in terms of fuel consumption. If you have all that energy efficient equipment on running and on the generator, and you're switching them all, yeah, you you won't see that big a difference in the fuel consumption. Unfortunately, it's probably at the starting point with the, with the sizing where you get the biggest benefit. And obviously, if you go with the, to a smaller generator, you're saving the daily rate of that too. So you know, there's a cost saving yes. involved with that too. Okay. Um, uh, but we can we can measure that for you um, uh, in terms of, of uh, you know what's the difference in fuel consumption rate from say 100 to 150 kVA and over a four day event that could be significant. Okay, so there's a real lesson to be learned. There is, um, you know, it's like hiring a car. You're hiring a V8 or you're hiring a 1.3 liter. Um, car. So at the outset, you're going to have a higher fuel consumption for a larger generator. So the risk yes. is if you're not using the capacity, that's when you're becoming inefficient. Uh, Correct. So I guess that overall for an efficient event, you, you want to have smaller power demand. But if you have certain production um, values and you've got things that need to be power, you've got a hundred food stores and they all need to have bay marines or whatever. Yes. That's sort of a given. So where you where you sit then with your efficiency 
is to ensure that you're using the right size generator and that it is being used at the optimal load as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yes, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Now I know uh, we've got um, Mick Jessup on the line and Mick's from Sydney Festival. So we might hear from him and I've got a specific question for, for you, Mick. I'm just going to mute Corey so we don't have him in the background. I'll just check first that Mick, you can hear me okay and that you're able to, we're able to hear you. Yeah, I can hear you, Megan. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. That's great. Thank you. Fantastic. So what I'm interested in um, is the whole power powering down of generators because we've heard from Falls Festival that the technique that they're using with a permanent site that you know they own or have permanent access to they can put distribution in therefore they can condense their generator requirements have fewer and larger generators they're working on a lot of history and they know their power demand so they can pretty much bet that they're going to be optimally using those generators in in an event that obviously can't uh, dig trenches and put permanent permanent temporary power distribution in uh, it, it's a bit of a different situation and one of the techniques is to use fewer uh, I mean smaller generators so that you're unable you're able to actually power them down completely affecting an efficiency um, outcome obviously and I know at Sydney Festival with overnight loads that's something that you guys have looked at so I'm wondering if you can share any tips from Sydney Festival. Yeah look Essentially what we do uh, with our sort of main outdoor event in Hyde Park uh, is that we do work with the supplier to figure out you know, what the capacities are going to be and what our requirements are uh, in each area of the park. However, it's, uh, it's a bit interesting because sometimes we need to have a high capacity generator to power all the nighttime activities. However, then when we throttle it back overnight, uh, we, we do have to um, have generators in use 24-7 because we need to keep fridges and freezers and all that sort of thing running. Yes. And while we do try and uh, and and get uh, those, that infrastructure powered by like the local park power, um, sometimes it's just not feasible with cable runs and, and, and all that sort of stuff. So okay. yeah, we work quite closely with the supplier to figure it all out. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, uh, sometimes yeah, we do have quite large generators purring away um, to, to run a couple of uh, reefers. Yeah, okay. And the, the reefers are a big um, power pool. They're, they're the refrigerated shipping containers basically, aren't they? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, the, that you put all your, all your beer in. Um, yeah, so I think that that's a, you've hit on something there that I have seen come through and I've been discussing with a, a lot of uh, event organisers that obviously if there's mains power available, this is what you want to be taking first up and putting your your 24-hour loads onto that is probably the best thing because then you can actually shut your generators down. So I think that that's definitely a, a trick. Now, Mick, I'm interested, you know, with the, the concept of energy efficiency, how would you describe it at an event, in the types of events that you're involved with? You know, are you talking about optimising your generator loads? Are you talking about using energy efficient equipment and being able to reduce the total generator sizes? You know, what does energy efficiency really feel like for you, um, given your you know, your experience and, and the types of events that you work on? Yeah, look, it's certainly something that we consider uh, when we're planning uh, all our different events, whether they be outdoors or indoors as well. We're often talking to venues about, um, you know, any sort of green action uh, plans that they have in place and how we can work in with them. Uh, you know, with the outdoor events as well, it's, a, it's something that we incorporate. We do have internally here a, a, a green action policy at Sydney Festival. Um, and look, it, uh, you know, while we do uh, always you know, try and be as energy efficient as we can, um, you know, we also have uh, uh, you know, budgets to meet, and so sometimes there are significant cost implications with you know, using a more energy efficient method. And so these are things that, like every year, we, we we look at what we've done, and then we look at what we can do better the, the following year. Yeah, okay, that's that's really good. We're going to talk about measuring in a moment as well, so we'll hear from people about what they've done to track and measure their power obviously it's very beneficial to do to find out you know what to uh, plan for next year but also to come up with an overall efficiency rating of your event is I think something that we need to be working towards as well thanks um, yeah that's right. 
yeah, I'm going to um, mute you now. <laughs> um, and I, I see that we've, um, we've also got some other people on the call who I've not spoken with yet. What I'd like to do is if you've got any specific questions, please put them in the chat box so that we can bring them up for, for discussion. Um, Abby's put some tips and tricks there into the chat box as well, which you can read. Um, now, I know that we uh, have heard from Coates already, and when I was talking to them before this call, they gave me a few little tips as well that they thought I should um, include. And one that I really, really liked was the using lighting towers as generators. So obviously um, with lighting towers, a lot of events are using those to light car parks or entries or, you know, for security purpose on the perimeter, et cetera. But you can, uh, they have power outlets on them as well. And, and so I thought that it was a really great way of doubling up your, um, your power distribution by using lighting towers on generators as well. Now, oh, sorry, using your lighter tower, lighting towers as generators as well. Now, I know that we've got... Um, Cameron Little on the call today, and I'm going to unmute him in a moment. Um, he's been involved in using uh, solar power at events, and I think that there's something that we can learn from solar power. Obviously, it's not a situation where, you know, right now major music festivals in Australia are going to be using solar power to run their staging or even all of, obviously all of their catering. Uh, but what somebody has to go through, what an organiser has to go through to be able to use these solar-powered kits, I think is something that we can really learn from. And so I'd like to talk to um, – whoops, sorry, I've just gone a bit crazy on my slides there. I'd like to talk to uh, Cameron to see what he's got to say about, you know, lessons learned from putting things on power diets, for example, at um, – at events on solar. Now, Cameron, I've unmuted you, so hopefully we can hear you. Good morning, Megan. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, yes, it, um, I've been running some some uh, solar trailers that are essentially mobile solar-powered generators at events running different equipment for a number of years now. Uh, and I guess I could, the, the key messages would be to reiterate some of the things that people have been speaking about regarding the uh, the petro generators, but just to emphasise the uh, matching of the load to the generator um, is a little bit more complex in that you've got to match, it's, it's not a matter of just flipping a switch, you've got to match the amount of uh, the sizing of the inverter so that you can bring it back to, to um, a 240. Uh, and also you've got to manage the size of the battery bank that you've got. So I know some people uh, for daytime events when they're running solar tend to rely on on having a lot of solar panels themselves um, and less batteries. My preference is to have a heavier load of batteries uh, and certainly to have um, panels, plenty of panels there, but to make sure that you've got a really significant uh, store of batteries. Otherwise, if you've got, if the, it becomes cloudy and the load is, or, or it moves into the evening and the load is, is greater than you're expecting, you could find yourself um, particularly stuck. Yeah. So I'm interested in the concept of a power diet. Um, with, you know, with, with pa uh, normal power generators running on fuel, we seem to be in a scenario where we ask the power users what they need and then we make sure that we have enough to cover that. And it seems as though the opposite is true with solar power, and this is where I think there's a lesson to be learned, that you very heavily regulate and um, work with the potential power users around what they want to power and work out how they can reduce that because it becomes quite a finite resource um, unless you've got a massive battery bank or a huge array of solar a solar array. So, you know, you, whilst solar power is obviously infinite, um, given a certain time period, it's not. So I think the whole concept of power diets and putting challenges back on power users is a really important um, way to uh, for us with diesel power generators to be able to reduce the size of those generators, therefore reducing the fuel consumption 
in total as well as per hour. So have you seen that, you know, have you seen pushback? Uh, so for artists, for example, you've got a stage, you're, you're solar powering a stage with, you know, six bands across a six hour period or something. And um, they all want to come with, with, with all the bells and whistles. Um, is there a way to engage them into the whole, you know, concept of power diets? Yes, certainly there is. Um, it's a matter of communicating with everybody well in advance that the intent is to run uh, the stage or parts of the stage or other elements of the event on solar in advance. So uh, I've um, worked on a larger, a larger size um, stage. It was still, it's a reasonably small stage though. Uh, it's in a, a community event, but a large community event with live music all day. And what we ended up doing was um, uh, powering a section of the stage. So we, we didn't power the, all of the equipment because we didn't want to push the the the, the uh, inverter harder than we were wanted to be comfortable with. So even though there is the batteries and the panels, really the, the big thing is, is the inverter uh, because you can have enough power to supply it, but if you can't suck it out of the battery fast enough, then you're going to have a brownout um, yeah, okay. and, and overload your inverter. Uh, and I have had that happen uh, on an event where somebody else borrowed one of my trailers uh, and they normally hire it to, for using for, um, for AV uh, and in this instance they didn't tell me but they were planned to use it to power a jumping castle. Oh, uh, yeah, so it's so an the, air compressor. Uh, yeah, and so they were, they hadn't really, <laughs> they'd never used it on a jumping castle or anything of that nature before. Uh, and uh, they, so I got this panicked call because normally I would be there. In this instance, they said, "No, no, we've got it, got it covered." And and they did. You know, I've worked with them plenty of times. I know that they know what to look for, but they didn't pay uh, attention to the fact that motors have starting loads. Uh, and also, they so they they were sort of going on what the consumption, yeah. what they assumed the consumption would be on a steady load, rather yes. than having to. to have a big jolt at the start. Yeah, okay. that also, is, that's a big trick for solar power, that's for sure. I don't want to go too far into the nuances of solar today, though, but so we're looking for things learned, you know, that are going to be relevant for diesel generators. Well, the, the, I guess the gener it comes back to the diet, knowing in advance what people are planning to use. Uh, and also, if there's any doubt, checking the, the actual consumption of the equipment, because sometimes what people assume it's going to use based on what they've been told by a hire company is not actually what it will use. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. so there, there's some, some key uh, traps for young punters to, to yeah. try to avoid. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, so I'm going to mute you now, Cameron, and we're going to try and uh, speak with Stephen again. So here we go. Let's see what we can see. So Stephen, it doesn't sound like we can still hear you. Um, I'm sorry about this for everybody. Um, hello, yes, hello. Stephen, is that you? Yes, okay, so I've unmuted everybody. So everyone be quiet and I'll just um, slowly go through and mute everyone. But, yeah, let's see what we've, you've got to say, Steve. Yeah, uh, I think uh, from our perspective, one of the biggest advices I can give to everybody is there is that the, um, and it was just highlighted in actually the solar information, that the actual connected load that we see the generators is generally grossly oversized. So the details when you create a, a set of load profiles for your event um, and the information you can get from store holders or um, uh, audio people or lighting people is very, very important in, in assisting and determining what is the best, most suitable generator. I actually typed a few things there if people had been reading the chat column there. Yeah, okay. A couple of points. Um, another uh, point that I wanted to bring up was that uh, the corralling of uh, generators and into those loads that we've been spoken about before about the the loads that need to run 24/7, yeah. uh, the the loads that can be turned on and off. Okay. Um, the other thing is we don't want to see too lightly loaded generators because then the efficiency of the generators aren't working at their optimal optimal best. Yeah. Um, we can also see a loss of efficiency of our generators where the machines are subject to long loads, uh, long light loads put on machines. Yeah, that, that actually then, damages um, the generators, doesn't it? It's not good for them at all. 
It does. The, the rules of thumb we use are we try not to put less than 30% load on a generator, yeah. and we try to operate the machine in the in the, about the 80% uh, of its rating range, and that seems to give us the best reliability and efficiency over the machine. Yes. The other thing is the the larger generators are the more efficient generators in terms of turning mechanical energy into electrical energy. Okay, that's good to know. Versus the smaller units. Yeah. And so could you um, opt in on the discussion around um, the, you know, the, the wasted energy opportunity? If you've got one of these larger generators on, we know that they're going to use more fuel per kilowatt hour. Um, but if you're not drawing down that, that power, so you, you are starting to come down into the you know, 50, 40, 30 percent range of its actual potential output, are you just wasting fuel? You know how, how where does the generator do, does the generator have the ability, or do generators most generators have the ability to sort of adjust their power output to a point? And is there a point where you're just going to be what you you know burning fuel off into smoke and you're just completely wasting wasting? You know what's what's the story it's, there? Okay. The, the, the position on that is that the generators, as Corey mentioned earlier, generally operated at around 1500 RPM, except for those little small no noisy things that you hear okay. um, on some small events. Yeah. Now, as loads applied to the generator, the governor of the engine says, I need more fuel to provide fuel to burn to, make, to meet that load demand. Okay. So obviously, as you increase load, fuel burn goes up. As you decrease load, fuel burn goes down. So, um, yes, if you take the, your uh, load off your generator at the end of the day and just let it sit in there with nothing on it, there's a certain amount of fuel that will still be burnt just to keep that machine operating at 1500, but nowhere near what it would be under load conditions. Okay, so there is, question? yeah, so there is, so it, it sort of, it it depends is your answer really, isn't it? So it, it um, you, you've got a, base a baseline amount of um, fuel that's going to be consumed. It's almost in the idling sort of scenario and it's going to um, be using more fuel for more power output as demand grows. So in that way, it is responding to your power demand by the things that you're putting on it, but you've got a baseline of you, you're going to be using this fuel whether, it, the, whether power's being pulled or not. So it's... That, that it, that's correct. With, yeah. with the, there are some now some small generators that are variable speed machines. Yes. And they probably have some um, better fuel performance uh, than standard 1500 RPM governed machines. But they're yeah. really only available in very, very small kilowatt uh, ratings yeah. these days. They're, yeah. they're not, they haven't made it up into the big time just yet. Yeah, okay. So uh, that probably answers your question. Yeah, no, I think it does. And I, I think it would be really interesting if there was a ready reckoner table to say, you know, for these different size gen sets, so 150, 250, 400, whatever, um, what the idle rate or very low load rate um, fuel consumption is uh, so that you know, so that you get a sense of importance or urgency around ensuring if you're going to go with a larger gen set, what that really means for total fuel used if you're not going to be using the generator power. So I think that's probably one of the best outcomes that we've come to today from this discussion is, is to maybe develop that resource so that people really understand, you know, what they're going to be wasting or losing by not optimising that particular generator. Obviously, in everything to do with events and, and life, really, you've got to balance... Um, priorities and so production um, performance is a huge priority for event for events and so you have to have that power on standby to be available but there is some um, juggling I'm sure that that can be done so that you've really got your eye on the ball to go okay this is the beast that we've got to keep at 70 to 80 percent these are the three smaller generators we're okay to lose a bit um in that, but we're going to be losing a lot if we don't optimise this particular gen set. Would you agree that that's a um, an option, you know, to take? Yeah, yeah, I would. Um, I yeah. think uh, someone touched on it earlier. I think using the large generators and everybody goes home at the end of the day ready for the next day, they yeah. just don't leave a large generator sitting there with one small globe on it. 
uh, when the next day is required to deliver 200 kilowatts of load. So yeah. um, I think, you know, where you can turn machines off, uh, then you, you're starting to improve your fuel efficiency of your event yeah. um, when, wherever you can, but it's balancing it out between what is a, um, an essential load versus what's not, not essential. Yeah, now I think you've touched on something there that generator um, companies have told me as well as they're surprised the number of times they'll turn up the next morning to uh, pick up their kit from the show the night before and it's just left there whirring because, you know, everyone's just sort of flopped over the line at the end of the big day and nobody's forgotten to go and turn the generator off. Do, do you see that very often or is that just, you know, one-off story that somebody's told me and, it, and it's not really the case? No, it's definitely not a one-off story, um, and yes, that that happens all the time, especially where paid paid storeholders uh, pack up and uh, go home. They're no longer selling their uh, goods, or events starting to wind down, and by the end of the day, um, there's nobody left there, and uh, everybody's still doing other things, but all yeah. the storeholders are gone home. Yeah, yeah. So that's something you know, in terms of process and and you know, site inductions and stuff that you really need to. Have your eye on that ball as well. That's for the event managers in the in the room, of course. Um, I'm seeing lots of chats happening in the chat box, so uh, do have a look at that. If you've got any questions to ask, please do ask. I think we worked out, Steve, what was happening before. You're on um, the phone with Sonia and you're on the web under your name, so I, I was muting Sonia before. That's what's um, been happening with the problem with your power, with your audio. So I'm just going to... Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to mute you now. Um, so you'll see on the screen we've got a um, we've got a sorry I'm just trying to mute everyone and talk at the same time it's clearly not working um, we've got a few tips on the screen and, and one of the things that I really liked and I've personally experienced this is using the hand loadable dizzy boards as distribution boards and boxes that you use when I was uh, working on an event uh, in the UK, actually, two events. One was Reading Festival and one was Leeds Festival. And one of the um, festivals had distribution boards, dizzy boards, that they could move around just on hand hand um, pallet jack sort of scenarios or even little hand trolleys. Compared with the other um, event, though I can't remember which was which, but one at the other event, the Reading or the Leeds, they needed forklifts to move their stuff around. And it had quite a big um, flow on impact for the overall resource use for those events. Obviously, we needed people, time, um, forklift availability and fuel consumption to get that stuff all around these massive sites. And also uh, the actual transport of, uh, you know, of truckloads of getting this stuff to site. So whereas the little hand-loadable distribution boxes and boards were able to just be beautifully stacked up quickly into a truck, it was quite a mission to um, to pack the trucks with the forkliftable distribution boards. So that's something to have a look at as well. You know, if, you, if you're looking at choosing between suppliers and you've got a large number of generators and a big amount of distribution, get down into that detail as well and have a look at what that means. So we've talked a bit about um, actually knowing what your energy efficiency is and that obviously comes down to measuring. And so we're going to talk about measuring, um, measuring generator fuel consumption in kilowatt hours and trying to come up with an actual efficiency rating. So you can see that on the screen um, I've got a screenshot of a spreadsheet which uh, is available via the Life Performance Australia project. Um, it enables you to, it's a series of worksheets behind this front page um, where you can track the generator number, the size, the location, the running hours, the amount of fuel used, etc. And that will give you some great history so you can get to the point where Falls Festival are, where they've got a fantastic resource of 20 years of knowledge. And, and um, so hopefully this spreadsheet will help you. But you can see on the screen that we've, Drilled it, drilled it down into uh, things that should be measured. So the number of generators, clearly, how many actual gen sets have you got on site you're going to be using, and the total KVA. I think that's a really important thing to log and to reflect on from event to event to see how you're going. Now, obviously, one event to the, ne the next may have different circumstances, different number of traders, different types of stage 
um, equipment, numbers of stages even. So you obviously be, need to be aware of um, any changing variables for your event layout. But it's certainly a good thing to track. Fuel consumption, um, the amount of fuel used per generator and as well as in total, something that should definitely be measured. Um, the running hours, of really, really important because that puts the whole thing in perspective. There's no use saying, oh, we had this number of generators and we use that much fuel, but you haven't also tracked how long the things were turned on. That completely puts it in context. And the true measure of efficiency or a true measure of efficiency, as we've heard, is, is optimising the power load on these generators. So getting them in that 70 to 80% sweet spot for as much of the time as possible um, is an important aspect as well. Now, I saw that um, there was a, a note from Abby up earlier saying that monitoring um, use and hours and logging fuel is all very labour intensive. And if you don't have the resources, the people or volunteers to check each generator multiple times a day, is there any t technology or any higher companies that can do that reporting? Now, I probably will throw back to Corrie in a moment um, about that. I'm going to unmute Corrie as well as Sonia because Steve might have something to say as well. But I do know there's also an amazing piece of technology that a Greco generator company have. It's not completely available all of the time, but it is something that you can look to request. And they have some back to base monitoring um, where they can monitor uh, gener uh, generators kilowatt hour consumption and it pings it back to a central service. So that's something in terms of innovation that's happening um, you know, into the future. And we probably will see all generator companies go that way eventually. But let's hear from um, from Coates to see what they might have um, to say around that. I'm just going to have to unmute um, Sonia, which you don't seem to be able to do. So what I'm going to do is unmute Cory. Oh, and Cory's not on the line anymore. So I'm going to have to forge ahead and try and unmute um, Sonia. Let's see. Um, Am I here? Yes, you are. I've got a bit of uh, reverb though, so keep going, talk, and I'll unreverb you. <laughs> okay, how's that? Very great. That's all done. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we have some uh, instrumentation in our machines uh, along the same lines of Agreco, yes, and we're in the same situation. We have that. Uh, remote monitoring uh, availability on some machines, not on all our machines. You know, we have somewhere in the order of about seven and a half thousand assets, so it becomes a bit of a problem to put that on everything. Yeah. Of um, the but what's in a lot of number of our controllers, or at least the last four years of introduction of new machines to our fleet is we actually have a lot of machines fitted with kilowatt hour meters. Okay. So at the start, at the you there? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yes. Yeah. At the start of an event, the kilowatt hour reading can be taken off the controllers on a number of machines. At the end of the event, the same can be. You can work out your total kilowatt hours uh, that way. We also have some logging functionality in the machines. We can actually log at set points uh, in the machine. So every uh, five minutes or every 15 minutes, okay. we can actually see what loads on the machines. But you know this stuff's in its infancy. It's only been around the last few years. Yeah. Um, and um, as time goes on, you'll see more and more of this stuff available. Um, but we readily use our gear now. Yeah. Okay. And so, what about fuel? I mean, what are the tricks to the trade of um, measuring fuel consumption? Because lots of different uh, events are dealing with fuel in different ways. We see some events where it's almost like a dry hire of the generator sort of thing, and the, they come fuel fueled up and they return fueled but the the event organizer arranges the fuel you know during the show um then we've got yep. other ways where you know the generator company is also fueling and i mean how how what's the technology i mean what apart from sitting there and and going oh i just put a jerry can into a generator and that's 10 liters how can you actually measure fuel easily obviously there's bowser well, scenarios but you know what what do you suggest that's the only way we can do it. It's got to go through a Bowser or a metering device to go into the fuel, you know. And it also depends upon the number, uh, the size of the fuel tanks in the machine. Some okay. some um, generators only have 12-hour 12, 12 tanks in them. Some have 24-hour tanks. Some yeah. may even have bigger than that. 
But so, really, the only way to measure it is that's why we supply the machines full of fuel. Yeah. And if we return it full of fuel, then you know exactly by the the fueling company, the refueler that's been employed for the event, yeah. how many litres have been used. But yeah. provided you don't double up on, um, uh, you know, uh, ancillary equipment as in forklifts or vehicles. Yeah, of course. Or, yeah. You, you need to you need to isolate your your power usage. Okay, so it's pretty much it's pretty much a, a a doing job. You know, you you have to look at your scenario and work out how you're gonna how you're gonna work out how much fuel's getting put into each gen set. I'm wondering, you know, is it easy if you were a lay site manager or event manager, or you were given giving the job to a a you know an intern or something to go around and work out the fuel consumption and what they were doing is just looking at when the when the techs were filling up the tanks it can 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 you walk to a generator and look on a label and see what size the fuel tank is or um you know is there a gauge that says it's half yeah, full and it's that many liters you know is there something like yeah, that to generally megan yeah, generally, Megan, the machines all have a fuel gauge on there. Um, you would need to know the specifics of what fuel tank's in there. Generally, we will tell somebody, what, after they tell us what their expected load is, we'll say, oh, you'll need to refuel that at the end of the day. Or uh, we do a lot, of, a lot of events where we'll say to somebody, look, this fuel tank in this machine, you're going to do, you, your load won't exceed that. You'll be able to run it all weekend. So yeah. generally, if we know that, but going back to those initial details about making sure you know what the load is, yeah. We as a hire company can give you the information to say, hey, we'll have to refuel this tonight or tomorrow or whenever. Okay. So if you're in a situation where you've you've hired 10 generators and the local fueling company is going to come and re refill the gen sets you know, every day and they're not really going to be completely full or what have you and you don't know whether you've emptied them out or whatever, obviously you're going to be able to get a... Um, total fuel invoice from the fuel provider. So that's one way that you can do it. You're not going to be able to get the specific fuel consumption for each generator. So you don't get down into that detail that you want. So that's when kilowatt hour logging, I think, is going to be quite important. But then on the flip side, you know, I've been in a situation where we've had several quite small generators and literally having a track, a, a, a a ute full of jerry cans and going around and, and filling them up that way has been sufficient. And so I, I guess it's a case of just um, working out the best way to log that fuel. I think, do, would you agree that it is better to know the fuel consumption per generator across an event or do you think it's enough to know total fuel across the entire event? Would you like to be, if you were given the job of analysing the efficiency of an event's energy provision, would you be saying I really, really, really need to know individual generator performance in a, in order to make a a good um, you know come up with a good report and really be able to learn from that report into the future? You know how important I think is you that? Probably, yeah, yeah. I think you probably do need to do both. So you've got a total a total consumption of uh, the whole event, but it is better to have it individually. Say, for example, the Commonwealth Games in two thousand and six we actually did know the amount of fuel that went into every generator. So the refueling company would look at each plant number of each machine and give us an invoice for each machine over okay. that event. That's how yeah. you set it up as an organiser. Okay. So I guess it, that comes down to how important is this information to know and why do you want to know it? And that's going to then direct you how, to how much effort you're going to put into it. So you as an event organiser need to decide, is this a major issue of concern that I really need to prioritise? Do I need to put resources into tracking this? Or actually, yes, that is all very important, but if I just tweak my system this little way, I'm going to be able to get the information that I need. Um, and, and a lot of it is going to be engagement with staff on the ground. It, it could be doing things such as hanging a clipboard in a waterproof pouch or something um, on the side of the generator with a great big note saying, please write down when you refueled it here, you know, and you might be able to get data that way. So I guess it's a case of uh, prioritising the issue and putting the effort in that, that you need to get that job done. So um, 
following on from from that, I'm I'm wondering if anyone, um, Abby, you might have anything to say, or anyone else actually that's on the call that's got anything to add to what we've discussed so far. If you can um, type a message in into the chat box and let me know if you want to um, discuss a particular point or if you've got anything to add to anything that's been discussed so far, I'd really really love love to hear some um, of you on the call. So please do add something into the chat box and I'll throw straight to you. Um, in the meantime, what I'm going to do is just mute Sonia again, Steve. Um, so I wanted to let you know about the call to action program that we've got going at Live Performance Australia. So we've developed lots of resources, um, uh, action plans and all sorts of um, checklists, etc., for events, including that spreadsheet that I showed you just before. But one of the things we've realised is that we really don't know um, how efficient our events are running in Australia, our outdoor music events. We, 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 we find that some events aren't really even tracking um, their fuel, simply the simple figure, the overall fuel figure. Now, whilst it's getting tracked through their accounts department, obviously, if they're going to be buying their fuel separate, that's there. But the event organisers concerned with the greenhouse gas emissions of their of their event and the energy consumption and fuel consumption of their event aren't really even going to the point of, of measuring fuel. So what we've done is um, taken that along with a step further of trying to see whether people would like to monitor their kilowatt hours and put a call to action campaign um, to the industry around knowing your power. So what we're hoping is that over the next year, we work with um, providers such as uh, Coates and Agreco and all of the other generator providers out there um, to be tracking your fuel consumption per generator and doing some metering to track kilowatt hours. So you can really see what your loads are on your generators and just how efficient you're going to be. So efficiency is going to come down to having the right number of generators for your job, having the right sized generators for your job, being as fuel efficient as possible, which comes down to loading those generators into that optimal load. That, of course, all completely comes back to um, knowing what your power demand is likely to be and having processes and measures in place to control power demand, especially from those pesky traders once they're there. So I think that um, putting monetizing um, around traders, uh, fuel cons uh, power consumption is something to, to help control those. But I think it would be really interesting to meet uh, um, some of the big bars and the big catering outlets um, to really see what their power sort of habit looks like. So we've said um, for everyone to put something into the chat box and I can see that I've got a, a moment there coming in from, from Abby. Actually, Abby, I can unmute you. You can ask your question if you'd like. Hi, you're unmuted. Hello. Hi. Um, yeah, it was great to hear from Coates that, you know, some machines are fitted with some of that technology, which is great. I think on site in Tassie we'll be able to um, monitor that fuel usage um, but I just wonder, in Tasmania, that we obviously come up against lots of limitations with um, some of the suppliers that we have down there, and I guess we just have to chat to Coates in Tasmania to see if the machines we get are capable of that. But I just wondered um, a question to some of the Coates guys. Would that those readings come at an extra cost when hiring the machines, or is it um, you know, no extra work for you guys to help with those sort of measurements? Oh, I need to unmute them. Hang on a moment. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm just going to unmute. Okay, we should be able to hear from Steve. Steve. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, Abby. First, first bit of an apology there. We actually uh, we're going to do that uh, this year at the Falls Festival, and uh, we um, we ran into a problem. One of the guys was supposed to take the readings and actually never took it. But um, that was just purely a, a management issue on the day that prevented that from happening. Um, yeah, no, you can actually take those readings yourself off the displays in your machines, and we're only happy, too happy to show people how to use those. Um, and so there's no other charge if that, if that equipment's already fitted to the machine. 
Okay, great. And are you, do you know if all the machines that we had from you guys last year had those capabilities or would we just maybe get lucky and a couple of them might have that? No, actually, it was only there was only a few machines out of there. I can't remember how many there were the machines in total, but there were only a few that could have done that down there in Tasmania at the moment. Mhm. Mm okay. Yeah. Well, that's good All to right. know. It would be really good to. It sounds like Falls Festival. Uh, you've got such a great history and and knowledge within their team of to accurately estimate their. Power can you know power demand and match that across to their um, generators. So it'd be really good to sort of you know put proof in the pudding as it were and do some um, kilowatt hour monitoring so that they can just take it to the next level and either prove that they're how fantastic they are or, or come up with any areas that they might need to tweak. So that'll be really great. Um, now I see a. a a mention here in the chat box from Brett Davis, and I'm having trouble getting um, getting him on to the audio. So his 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 chat box mention was the biggest issue with fuel consumption is oversizing. Um, they installed two 320 kVA gensets on the main stage at Big Day Out, and it had a total load of 120 kVA. Um, so what they're saying is, you know, is over -spec, they've overspec that by up to 200 kVA. Better education about calculating re realistic loads is the key. And I think um, that's a really good way of finishing off this webinar for today is that we have produced a fantastic amount of, um, of resources and information at the Life Performance Australia. And so um, please do have a look at our website and have a look at those resources. And if you find yourself in a situation where you're the generator tech or a site manager that's been contracted in, um, and you're sort of a bit of a middleman person um, between generator suppliers and between power users, say stage production um, teams, then, you know, using some of that, uh, those resources and, and using pulling out some of the language and trying to have those conversations with power users to really get them to understand what the impacts are of over-specking, the fact that they're wasting money, probably quite a significant amount of money, as well as, of course, wasting fuel and creating unnecessary greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I think that, you know, they're, they're the three things. So, um, that's uh, probably going to wrap us up for today. Uh, thank you so much to everybody for coming onto the call today. Um, it, we, we have recorded this session and it will be available online if you know of anybody that would want to hear it. Um, you can contact us uh, on the email on the screen, greener at liveperformance.com.au uh, um, and you can follow us on at liveperthost. Um, there's also a LinkedIn discussion group. So thank you to everybody for listening today and I'll sign off for now. Bye-bye.